Remember this morning we were talking about the relationship of the Christian to the world. And I really believe that this is critically important for us to realize our relationship to the world. There is so much being said and taught out there today in the name of Christianity that, quite frankly, is not right. And you see it everywhere, anything from A to Z. You know, I I was just meditating this afternoon. There are so many humanitarian outreaches to mankind of wanting to take care of the sick and feed the poor and end poverty. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? It's all fine and good in its proper place, but I believe that a lot of ministries and a lot of Christians have it out of place. And the reason why I say that is because of John chapter 6. And it's a great chapter, and it's a long chapter, and sometime we probably ought to go through it verse by verse. But, you know, in the beginning of John chapter 6, uh, Jesus starts off by feeding the 5,000. And how many of you know that makes you real popular real quick, especially in a region that's suffering from drought and famine and poverty? These, were living, these folks were living in impoverished times. And so uh, it, it actually makes the comment there in John chapter 6 that after he fed the 5,000, that Jesus withdrew from the mount to the mountain because he sensed that the people wanted to take him by force and make him king. Okay, so that's how his popularity was running real high. And he could feel that feverish tempo in the people to want to make him a natural king. So he withdraws from the mount to the mountain to get away. Now, how many of you would have the character to do that? Or how many of you would like to be king for a day and uh, ride on the wave of the popularity. So he withdraws, and then, you know, some neat things happen overnight. Remember, that's the night that he comes walking on the waves to his disciples in the middle of the sea there. And uh, so by next morning, they end up on the other side of the sea, and the people follow him. And do you remember the first thing he says to them? As they walk up on him and they say, Master, you know, how did you get here, or how long have you been here? He said, guys, let me tell you something right up front. You're only following me because yesterday I filled your stomachs. And they said, well, Lord, give us a sign. You know, can you give us a sign to prove that you are who you are? And guess what sign they came up with? They said, you know, hint, hint, Moses gave Israel manna out of heaven. Maybe, Jesus, you could do a miracle like manna out of heaven and feed us again and maybe then we would know that you are truly who you say you are, you know, tempting him. And uh, much like the temptation of, of the enemy in the, in the temple, when the enemy said, throw yourself down and prove that you are who you say you are. And so what did he say? He, he then used that moment to say, look, guys, you're only following me because I filled your bellies yesterday. Let me tell you something. I am the bread of life. And so what he was trying to convey to Israel is this, there is something more important than ending starvation. And there is something more important than meeting people's natural needs. The natural needs will always be there. The poor you will always have with you. There will always be hungry. There will always be sick. Are we to take care of them? Yes, absolutely, as much as we can. But the first priority is always the bread of life, the spiritual. And so that's our emphasis, and that's our priority as we minister to these people. So consequently, Jesus didn't feed them a second time, even though that's what they wanted. And in fact, he started down this discourse of, I am the bread of life. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood to have it life in you. And they all got mad and offended and left. And so... Uh, Popular one day, he would have been king for about maybe, you know, 20, 24 hours. And then the very next day, they were all gone. And so uh, that, Jesus' model of ministry there has got to be our priority. Our first goal is people's spiritual life, not their natural life. Now, we try to help as much as we can always. But our first goal is making sure they get to heaven, not necessarily feeding them a meal. And so that's the priority that Jesus set, and so that's our priority, and that's one way that we can see what our relationship in the world is supposed to be. 
Jesus made some very clear statements. Uh, we went through this morning, and I don't want to go through these again, but some of the points we covered this morning is that God wants to take us out of this world. He leaves us here physically, but spiritually he removes us to the place, the scripture says, where it's as if we're already there seated with him in heavenly places. So he's given us the power, the power of the Holy Spirit to live in this life as though we're already there with him in heavenly places. That just blows my mind. I don't know about you, but every time I say that, it just it does something on the inside of me. I'm, I feel like I'm living so far short of that. Boy, that needs to be our goal, to live here as if we're already living there by the power of God. And so we saw all of these verses and phrases where it talks about how we've been taken out of this world, the partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. All these scriptures made it very clear to us this morning that there is to be a separation, there is to be a difference. The difference between you and a non-believer is to be as clear as light and day, the scripture says. We are no longer to live according to the corruption and sin of this world, but we are to live unto God, and yet God has left us here. Why? Why are we still here if we're pilgrims and strangers? God has left us here because he wants us to be ambassadors. He wants us to be salt and light. He wants people to see the difference. He's not willing that any should perish. And so he wants us to be here in the world, not of it, completely different and separate, but he wants people to see a difference in us. And hopefully they'll want to join us. We said that that difference, you know, that comes, we've referred to it many times as sanctification or holiness. Sanctification and holiness are really synonymous, parallel terms. That means we are set apart. We're set apart from something, set apart to something. And so how does this sanctification take place? We saw this morning that it was because of the change of heart in us as we're born again. As we go through John chapter 17 here, this is a prayer that Jesus prayed the night he was betrayed. And so it's special in that these are his last thoughts, his last prayers for us as he's about to depart. And I want you to see three words here that are going to stand out in his prayer as we go through it verse by verse. Separate, guarded, and sent. And all three of those words apply to us as Christians. And so if you want to define in some way what is our relationship to the world, according to Jesus, it all fits into those three words, separate, guarded, and sent. All right, so think of those three words as we go through this verse by verse. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. The hour is at hand. This was the night he was to be betrayed. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And we've got to stop there and look at some of these words. And we've discussed this before, but that word eternal, in the phrase eternal life, it's talking about life as only God has it. And let that sink in tonight, please. You can have a quality of life in your daily routine that only God has. He can be that personal, that alive, that powerful in you. You can have a life residing in you, pulsating through you that only God has. That's pretty exciting. How do we get this life? This is life eternal. This is how you partake of that life. It's through relationship. It's through knowing him, like we were talking about this morning. And the change, the transformation that takes place in your heart as you know him through relationship, that is what makes you different. This separation that we're talking about, 
this separation is nothing that can be legislated. You don't have to get up on the, the table in the break room at work and start shouting repent to your coworkers. You know, I guess God could lead you to do that, but it um, may get you escorted out by security real quick. But uh, it, it's nothing that's legislated. It's nothing that's forced. It, you're going to be different, real different. It, the difference is going to be the difference between light and darkness. And it comes simply through relationship. It's not going to be anything that you have to try to do or force to do. It's just you're different because you're being transformed from the inside out. And so this is how Jesus begins his prayer, and this is going to set the tone for the rest of the prayer, that this is how his disciples were to be distinguished from the rest of the world. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people and I've underlined some phrases here. These are the phrases that we have got to get in our hearts. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me, how? Out of the world. Now next week, you know, I, I want to talk about some of the practical things of this. But one of the things is, you know, Father, you brought these people out. When you go to work every day, you're probably not going to be one of the guys or one of the girls. They're not going to invite you in probably to their private conversations or to their raunchy jokes or they're not going to include you in that circle and you're going to be, have to be okay with that. You're going to have to settle in your heart and mind that Jesus is enough and I don't need the acceptance or the approval of the world because Father has not called you in, he's called you what? Out. There's going to be that distinction. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And keeping his word, boy, that is what really sets you apart. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them. And they've come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. And I, I think this is a verse here in verse 9 that can be really misunderstood and misapplied. Jesus is not saying it's wrong to pray for the world. All he's saying is here on this night, right before I'm betrayed, right, right before I'm to depart from this earth, I'm praying for the Christians. I'm praying for those who belong to Father. And all of these things that he's praying really don't apply to the world. They apply to us, the Christians. So that's what he's saying. So it's not wrong for you to pray for an unsaved person, is what I'm saying. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And that gets back into what we were talking about this morning, where our spiritual parentage has changed. Our spiritual citizenship has changed. We are in a completely different kingdom now with a different father operating by different heart impulses, operating by different brain activity, operating by a different energy, a different life source. Everything has changed. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. And look at that word keep. I put in a really long definition. But it means to keep in custody. It means to guard. There's an emphasis in this word in the Greek that emphasizes, emphasizes to the very end. So Jesus is asking Father to guard you to the very end of this life till you make it home to heaven, that should bring you comfort. Successfully presenting at the end that which was guarded. Isn't that a wonderful thought? The Father is guarding you and he's keeping you. I think, I think that's why Jesus taught us to pray, deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. Father, guard and keep us. Do you know that if, unless Father keeps and guards your heart, we will all be overcome? 
We need his keeping. We need his guarding. Father, keep them in your name. But the main thing that we need to take away from this is that there, is this. There's something out there that we need to be guarded from. There's something out there that's evil, that's hideous, that's dangerous, that will destroy us if we let it in. You know, it, again, this is a mindset that many times we think that there is something out there in this world that's kind of attractive and we'd like to play with and flirt with or, or uh, entertain temporarily or we'd like to just experience once or twice or everything that's out there is evil and destructive and deadly. And Jesus is praying to the Father for him to keep us from those things that would entice us to the flesh. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. That's one function that Jesus did. I have guarded them. I, I've kept them. I watched over their souls. Fathers, husbands, this should really speak to you. You need to keep and guard your families. And you need to keep the devil from coming into your homes and stealing from your children, stealing from your spouses. It's your job, guys, to be the watchman over your house. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled. Then that, <laughs> guys, heave up sigh of relief, even Jesus lost one, okay? You, you can't help people that don't want to be helped. And when people make certain decisions by their own free will, there's nothing you can do. And so, don't get discouraged. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel like it's your fault, because it's not. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. When you're willing to finally let go of the world and cling to Jesus, there is such a joy in the presence of God. There's there's such a joy in being whole and clean and free and there's no longer any guilt tormenting you and the depression and the darkness has left. There's such a joy that comes from serving Jesus and being separated from the world if only we would believe it. But how many times there's still that little voice inside that says, I've got to have a little taste of the world. Just like Lot. Just like Lot's wife. When she was leaving the life that she knew, she just had to take one more look and look back. And look what that one look cost her. Are you willing to suffer that kind of loss just to have one more taste, one more look? If only we could find that joy of being separated to God and live there and stay there. I have given them your word, and the world has what? Hated them. When you receive and believe and speak and live the word of God, the world will hate you. In the neighborhood, on the job, when you refuse to criticize your boss the way everybody else is, when you refuse to lie to cover something up, they will turn on you and hate you. When you refuse to you know, separate into their little clique and do things their way and ostracize certain others, they will hate you for not playing the game of politics that they want to play. When you live the word of God and do things rightly and just and fair and honestly, the world will hate you. Is that okay with you? Are you ready for that? Have you counted the cost? And it's the word of God that divides and brings separation. Like I've said many times already tonight, you won't have to force it. It will just happen on its own. There will be this great gulf between you and them. The world has hated them because they are not of the world. They have, now have a new heartbeat. They now have a new purpose in life. They now have someone else they're living for and imitating. Verse 15 is key. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. <laughs> now we would ask, God please take us out, but... Jesus didn't ask. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you would what? Keep them from the evil one. Are you really aware of the spiritual battlefield you go into every day? 
the lusts and the temptations and the cares and the worry and the fear and the depression that's just waiting as sin by the door. As the Lord told uh, Cain, it's just wait. If you let it in, it's right there and will overcome you. But there is something out there, the evil one, that you and I need to be protected from. And so Jesus was praying, I don't ask that you take them out of the world. They need to stay in the world. You know, if Father's heart was not so big in wanting to save the lost, we would have been out of here by now. But because he loves the lost and he's not willing that any should perish, he leaves you and I here. So that somehow more can be reached. Are you reaching them? They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the, what? Truth, your word is truth. So the good news is, when you go out into the world every day, you don't have to try to act holy, or act pious, or try to you know, tell them how different you are. Just live the word of God. Just receive the word of God. Just be transformed by knowing him and you'll be separated soon enough. Sanctify them, set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so have I, what? Sent them into the world. That's why we're here. We're not here to become CEO. We're not here for promotions and raises and bonuses. We're not here to, uh, you know, Christianize our government and save the world. We're here very simply sent by our Savior to be salt and light. For their sake I consecrate myself that they also might be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, meaning these 12 or the 72, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Jesus' prayer for us is that we would be one. Not squabbling and fighting and fussing and competing. Not holding grudges and unforgiveness. He wants us to be one. Just like the Trinity is one. And as we do that, then the world may believe that you have sent me. How do we show the world that we are of God? By our unity. Not by ecumenical movements. Not by agreeing with false doctrine. We're not saying that. But those of us here in this room, to reach this community around us, we need to be one, unified. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me. You know, gee, Jesus does that a lot. Abide in me, and I in you. And it gets your brain all twisted up because you can't figure out how we do that. But really, it's just a, it's a, it's a way of saying there, there has to be that intimate union between heart and heart, mind and mind, to where you can't tell the difference between the two. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. <laughs> How do you know Father's going to answer that prayer? One day we will hear that voice, and Father will answer Jesus' prayer, and we will be with him where he is. To see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me for, before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. What a precious prayer. And how precious it is for us to get this first-hand view into the heart of God for us today. And Jesus really sets the tone of the church here, doesn't he? I mean, he, he really sets the church on mission, on course, through this prayer. But remember those three words? What were they? Separate, 
guarded and sent. Jesus makes it very clear that we are to be separate. It's not anything that we're going to have to try to do as we are in relationship with Him and we're changed from the heart out. We will be very separate. It will be very obvious, as obvious as light from dark. Secondly, we need to be guarded. There's evil out there. There's an evil one out there. There's things out there that will destroy us. And thank God that Father is watching over us and guarding us. We need that. So the world isn't anything to be entertained or played with. There's things out there that will rob you of your salvation. And then last, as we're separate and as we're being guarded, we are also what? Sent. Sent to be salt and sent to be light. And there's a fine balance in all of these three things. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. You know, uh, what do you do? There is a time when that passage in Corinthians about come, uh, come out from among them and be separate. There was a time a few decades ago, you all remember, where a lot of the teaching was you can never go into business with an unchristian, with a non-believer and things like that. Uh, I think that's one of the last things that passage is trying to say. I don't think that really applies to that at all. But we'll talk about things like that. We'll talk about what to do if you're married and your spouse is an unbeliever. You know, uh, what to do uh, around the office when, you know, the, the guys ask you out to the bar to take a couple drinks after work. And, you know, I want to talk about some nitty gritty things like that that we all face every day. So everything we learn today in doctrine and in theory, how do we apply it? And we'll talk about those things next week. Father, we thank you that you are our sanctifier. And you promise that you will preserve us holy and blameless until the day that Jesus returns. So it's not up to us or our works or our efforts. As we surrender in relationship in you, as we know you personally, you will change us from the inside out. And it will be obvious that we're different. Obvious that we're separate. Father, thank you for the power of God to keep us. As we go into the world tomorrow, we have the confidence that Father is watching over us and we are being kept and guarded by the power of God. And greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world. So we're not afraid of the world, but at the same time, we're not ignorant of the evil that's there and the danger that's there. Father, thank you for loving us and watching over us. And now as we go, I just ask for your Holy Spirit to guard and protect every heart and every life in this room. Father, we ask that the devil would not have one place in our hearts or in our homes this week. We ask that the presence of God would drive him out. And that we would live in the victory that Jesus Christ purchased in his resurrection. Because if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us, that spirit will give life and power to our mortal bodies. We believe and receive that Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.